Hello everyone, this is Cabane the Christian. Today we're going to be continuing our series on Orthodoxy and Catholicism, their similarities, differences, and relationship. Uh, today I want to talk about what I consider one of the most important, if not the most important difference between Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism. Now in my last video I mentioned the letters of Patriarch Peter III, a little known voice from the 11th century, who after the incident between Michael Serularius and Cardinal Humbert, uh, which saw the mutual excommunications of the churches of Rome and Constantinople, wrote letters both to Serularius uh, uh, and to the Pope of Rome. Now it's important to note from the outset here that even though 1054 is the traditional date of the schism, this really is not so simple. Uh, the schism between the churches of the East and the churches of the West was a gradual and sometimes silent affair. It had roots in the late first millennium and it developed slowly over a period of about two or three centuries. Uh, moreover, the schism between the East and West is really not like any other major schism which had ever happened in church history before. Uh, for example, if one considers the schism over uh, uh, Christology after the Council of Chalcedon. Uh, this was not, even though it is often seen as, a severance of communion between churches in two different regions. Rather, this was uh, these were internal schisms in the local churches involved. Uh, for example, in the Church of Alexandria, two competing lines of Episcopal succession developed in the Church of Alexandria. Likewise, in the Church of Antioch, there were two competing Episcopal lines of succession, and both the schism happened immediately over something which was definite, and it was signified by these parallel hierarchies which had developed. And actually, a break within a local church is the traditional definition of a canonical schism. The schism between East and West was not really like this because it did not, at least at first, see the creation of a parallel hierarchy. That's why we don't have a Pope of Rome who is in communion with the churches of the East. Uh, it rather was a severance of communion between two different regions which had very different histories and which had developed different theological grammars. Um, I say that in order to give the background for the way the schism actually occurred. Uh, so in uh, the 11th century, uh, in 1014, the uh, Pope of Rome, Benedict VIII, added filioque to the creed that was recited at the Mass. He did so in order to curry favor with the German emperor from whom he needed help and assistance. Uh, now, there is some controversy over this point, but there is some evidence that he, his name was struck from the diptychs of some Eastern churches at this point in time. And I think that's an important point to make because sometimes one sees the claim that the filioque was only ever important to the East when it needed to outmaneuver the West for political purposes or ecclesiastical power. I'll say more about that in a bit, but the evidence is very strong that this is not the case, that it was indeed theological. Now, the schism, uh, uh, one of the major events uh, in, which led up to the schism was the mutual excommunication between churches of Rome and Constantinople, 1054. Um, it's a story which is well known, so I won't go over it now. I will only say that actually the excommunication from Cardinal Humbert was invalid because the Pope had died a few days before he made it, uh, and it was not permanent. So uh, other churches heard about it. They did not consider this a real severance between East and West. In fact, communication between the two continued for centuries. Both Latins and Greeks could receive Eucharist at uh, their respective churches. Uh, and so on and so forth. Now, Patriarch Peter III was the Patriarch of Antioch at this point in time. And when he had heard what had happened in Constantinople, he write, wrote to Michael Serularius, because Serularius had a whole list of problems the Latins had. Most of them involved a difference of liturgical customs, for example, fasting on Saturdays. Now, Patriarch Peter said, you are making uh, major issues out of what are really minor liturgical differences, which don't actually matter. And this is what he considered all of the differences which Serularius had listed, except two issues. First, the issue of azymes, unleavened bread in the Eucharist, which I discussed in my last video. And second, he said the filioque. The filioque was an important difference 
between Rome and the East. And in fact, the East should insist that Rome not adopt the filioque into the creed. Uh, uh, so we see that even from a voice who was very concerned to maintain fraternal communion between East and West, he considered the filioque to be a very, very serious problem. Uh, now, as time went on, East and West maintained communion. In fact, the late 11th century, uh, the Eastern Church was, uh, the Church of Constantinople was asked why they were not commemorating the Pope in the diptychs, and they said, I don't know why, and they added the Pope back into the diptychs. Uh, uh, but over time, tensions increased, especially in the midst of the high papal reformation, which saw popes of Rome asserting their authority in much more direct and concrete ways. And they asserted this, they attempted to assert this authority over the East as well. One of the things which changed was that it was traditional for a pope of Rome, upon his elevation to the papacy, to send a confession of faith around to the Eastern churches, so that the Eastern churches would know the new pope confesses the the same faith as the old one, and so we can add him to the diptychs, just like we've commemorated the popes of Rome before that. But it came to be seen that it was just absurd for the Pope of Rome to have to prove his orthodoxy to anybody, because, of course, it was the Pope. This was the Church of Rome, which could never defect from the faith. Uh, tensions really broke, uh, re really came to a head in the late 12th century and the early 13th century. In 1182, the Emperor of Constantinople ordered the slaughter of all Latin Rite Christians in the city of Constantinople. Uh, if I remember correctly, there were tens of thousands of Latin Christians who were killed, uh, men, women, and children. It was a terrific atrocity, and it poisoned relations between the Eastern and the Western churches in a way that could not, re that was not healed. 20 years after, uh, about 22 years after this, partially in response to the slaughter of the Latin Christians at Constantinople, the Crusaders took a, uh, a detour, which they were not supposed to take. They sacked Constantinople and the seat of the empire moved for quite some time out of Constantinople and became the Nicene Empire. When this happened, the Latin Church uh, set up a parallel hierarchy in the East. So there were now Latin Rite patriarchs of all the major patriarchal sees in the East. Uh, after this, the first attempted reunion council was held at the Second Council of Lyon. Uh, the East was not well represented, not all of the major patriarchal sees attended. And most of the negotiation took place directly between the Pope and the Emperor. Uh, and because it took place between the Pope and the Emperor, the bishops were not really involved, their input was not needed, and because the bishops were in fact the persons who were responsible for resolving the schism, it never really worked. At Two Leones, the game was essentially given up to the Latin Church, and of course the schism didn't take. The people were opposed to it, the hierarchy was opposed to it, it just was not going to work. After the Second Council of Lyons, a council uh, was held called the Council of Blackernay, or Blackernay, I don't know how to pronounce it exactly. Uh, and at this council, the official Orthodox response was given to the Confession of Second Lyon. And it, uh, this dealt with the procession of the Holy Spirit uh, under the leadership of uh, Gregory II of Cyprus. And it taught that the Holy Spirit proceeds as regards his hypostasis from the Father alone and thereby derives his eternal uh, and personal characteristic in that procession, but that, but that in the same movement out from the Father, he glorified the Son, came through the Son, and manifested the communion between Father and Son to the Father and Son, and also to us uh, when God created the world. I will speak of this a bit more in a few moments. Uh, another attempted reunion council was held at Florence, and the main topic of discussion, as at Two Leones, was the filioque. It was not the papacy. It was the filioque. Um, the vast majority of the debate concerned this topic. Uh, the, it eventually reached a stalemate. The Byzantines wanted to go home. Uh, patriarch, the Patriarch of Constantinople was dead. However, a signature was forged in his name. Uh, the the reunion council was signed by all of the Orthodox representatives except St. Mark of Ephesus. However, after the council, the Pope celebrated a mass 
where none of the Orthodox representatives communed. Uh, they did not begin to commemorate the Pope in the diptychs, in fact, and they renounced it as soon as they came home. This is an important point because it is sometimes claimed that the uh, 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 caliph, after the conquest of Constantinople, imposed the schism. This is nonsense. Anybody who says it has no clue what they're talking about because the schism actually was never resolved in the first place because the sign of ecclesiastical unity is Eucharistic intercommunion. But none of the Orthodox representatives, despite signing the Statement of Union, communed from the Pope's chalice and they did not begin commemorating the Pope except at the very end uh, when the Turks were at the gates, when the Pope said he wasn't going to send military help, then less they commemorated the Pope. So in, in Constantinople, they commemorated the Pope, but as we all know, no help came. Turks conquered the city at the end of the story. Now, I told you this story uh, just to give you a broad overview of the narrative, but also to make a point along the way that the main issue of contention between East and West was not the papacy, it was the filioque. In fact, arguments about the papacy only began in the mid, um, uh, I believe it was the 12th century, the mid 12th century. This is the first time you start getting Byzantine polemics against the Pope's claim of universal headship over the church. We're going to be speaking of that more in my video on the papacy, but I just want to make that note that the issue of contention was the filioque. And here is why it was an issue of contention. Uh, I guess before I say why it was, I want to make the point that this was not a political issue. One often hears from Roman Catholic apologists, oh, the East didn't actually care about this. This was a cynical power play by Photius and by later Byzantines in order to justify severing communion with Rome because they didn't want to submit or something like that. But in fact, the evidence is definitive that this is not the case. Uh, our most important piece of evidence comes from a letter of Maximus the Confessor uh, in the 7th century. This is before the Phocian Schism or anything like that. Uh, Maximus, in his letter to Marinus, was writing to Byzantines who questioned the orthodoxy of the Pope because the Pope, in a letter, uh, spoke of the procession of the Spirit from the Father and the Son. Now, this was actually mistranslated from Latin into Greek, so that it seemed that the Pope was saying that the Spirit proceeded from the Son in the same way that he proceeded from the Father. Maximus wrote to them and said, this is not the case. In fact, by uh, this phrase, the Church of Rome only confesses that the Spirit's procession from the Father is manifested through the Son, thereby confirming the unity and identity of the essence, and also that the Romans know that the Father is the only cause of the Spirit, and that the difference between the Son and the Spirit lies in their manner of origin from the Father, namely the Son is generated, the Spirit proceeds. This is a very important text for several reasons. First of all, because it demonstrates that the Byzantines also already regarded the double procession as a matter of apostolic orthodoxy. This is not a political power play. Second, it demonstrates that Maximus understood that a certain understanding of the double procession would constitute heresy, and he wrote to defend the Roman Church on that ground. The third reason it's significant is the way in which he defends the West. Maximus, who knew the Pope, who lived in Rome, who knew both Greek and Latin, Maximus states that by these, in the, the language they used to describe the procession, and by the way, remember that in Rome, the filioque was not in the creed at this point in time, but Maximus says what they really mean is that the Spirit's procession from the Father is manifested eternally through the Son. And so you have this notion of an eternal manifestation, which is going to be developed further by Gregory II of Cyprus, Synod of Blacherni, and St. Gregory Palamas in particular. Uh, this becomes an important point at the Council of Florence, because at Florence, when various patristic evidences are being set forth, uh, the letter to Marinus occupies a very important place in the Byzantine argument against the Latins. And the Latins, when they looked at this epistle, many of them argued that it had to be a forgery, because they were arguing that the spirit, are, that father and son together constitute a single cause of the spirit's existence, but Maximus suggested that would in fact constitute heresy. So the fact that they understood it, or so many of them argued that it was a forgery, shows that it's not that Maximus is stating the filioque as it was dogmatically confessed by the Church of Rome in the medieval area. 
era. I've seen some Roman Catholic apologists cite the letter de Marinus as definitive evidence that, in fact, Maximus regarded the filioque way as orthodox and that East and West were really saying the same thing. Well, I agree, in Maximus's own day, East and West were saying the same thing, but the question is whether the Roman Catholic Church of the medieval period was saying the same thing as Maximus and of the East and West of Maximus's day. And I'm going to try to explain to you why the evidence seems to be clear that Roman Catholics of that period, or at least many of them, were not saying the same thing. So, in order to do this, I have to explain the Catholic doctrine of the Filioque as it was articulated by two Leones, by Florence, um, and interpreted by Aquinas. Uh, according to the Roman Catholic doctrine, the Father generates the Son eternally, and the Son is the Son in virtue of his generation from the Father. Why is the Father Father and the Son Son? Because the Father is ingenerate and generates the Son, and the Son is generated from the Father. You also have the Holy Spirit. So, how does the Holy Spirit come to exist? Of course, by come to exist, I do not mean that temporally, but he derives his origin from the Father. Uh, According to the Second Council of Lyon, the Father is the principal cause of the Spirit. That is, he is the main source. However, the Son is also a cause of the Holy Spirit, but in a secondary way, because he participates in the Father's power of spiration in order to give birth or to generate the person of the Spirit. So the Father is the principal cause, but the Son participates in the Father's spirit of power, and so produces the third person of the Trinity. Now, many Roman Catholics would say, well, then why does the East object? Because we still preserve the monarchy of the Father. And it's true that Rome preserves the monarchy of the Father, and anybody who says otherwise doesn't know what they're talking about. However, the question is whether this notion of the Son's participation in the spirit of power of the Father is coherent according to the traditional standard for Orthodox theology. And here's why it's not. For Orthodox and for the Fathers, the three divine persons are God because they share the same essence, so they're one because they share the same essence or nature, and they are three because each of them is distinguished from the other two by a particular hypostatic property which is not participable. The essence is what they have in common and what the Son and the Spirit receive from the Father, but their hypostatic hypostatic existence is guaranteed by the fact that each of them are irreducibly different from one another because they have one particular property which is different from the other two. The property which the Father has is that of being the source of the Trinitarian Godhead. That which the Son has is that of being generated or eternally born from the Father and being given his essence thereby. And that which the Spirit has is in procession from the Father. The Lord Jesus in the Gospel of John, he in fact puts this very well when he says the Father has given it to the Son to have life in himself. And at first this appears paradoxical. If the Son has life in himself, then it would seem that he could not have been given this by anybody else because he has it in himself. But he says that his having life in himself is given him from the Father. And this is explained by the eternal generation of the Son. God exists necessarily. God has life in himself. He is the only person who has ontological existence in himself, but God, in being God, gives birth eternally to the Son, and in that giving birth communicates his essence, which is self-existent to the Son. And he does the same for the Spirit, but by procession rather than generation. So according to the fathers, what is it that distinguishes procession from generation? Well, according to the fathers like Gregory the Theologian, Maximus the Confessor, and John of Damascus, that which distinguishes generation from procession is the manner of origin from the father. That is, generation and procession are different because these are two different ways by which the father gives himself uh, and gives his existence to another person. What is the nature of that difference? Well, these fathers say that the nature of this difference is uh, 
incomprehensible, but we know that the difference is in the different ways of giving existence to these two divine persons. And that this manner of distinguishing them is very, very important. But uh, let me say a few more words about this notion that the hypostatic properties are imparticipable. Uh, it's important that they be imparticipable uh, because they are what distinguishes the persons from one another. And in fact, this is not just true for God, this is true for us. This is what Scotus would call an hexaity, uh, or the thisness of a thing. I have human nature. I have human nature in common with every other person. Uh, a, a person is given existence in human nature through the conjugal act, so a person can give their nature to another. However, I have the property of being exactly and irreducibly myself. I'm Seraphim Hamilton, and my union with God won't eradicate that. God won't become Seraphim, uh, and I won't become the Father or the Son or the Spirit. However, we'll be joined together in a relationship of mutual indwelling or perichoresis, which the persons of the Trinity also share eternally. Uh, and so given that the hypostatic property is precisely that which distinguishes persons from one another, if they participated in these hypostatic properties, then it would eradicate the distinction between persons and thereby also undermine the reality of deification in which a person is realized in his own unique identity and not subsumed into another being. So that, that's the essential point. So the point is not the monarchy of the father for its own sake. It is a particular way of understanding the monarchy of the father uh, according to the fathers of the church. Now here's the problem. According to Aquinas, who, as I think I've said before, I regard as a brilliant theologian, uh, a man of genuine sanctity, a true saint. Um, he appeared to a, an abortionist in Russia and converted him to the Orthodox faith. He's, I believe firmly he's in heaven. However, his testimony in this point is very, very important. Because remember what I st stated about the mode of distinction between generation and procession. It's integral to patristic theology that the mode of, uh, uh, the mode of distinction between generation and procession be in manner of origin from the father. However, what Aquinas says, he says in arguing for the filioque that the difference between generation and procession is the number of persons involved in the act. That is, the difference is not two different ways in which the Father gives his own existence to the Son and the Spirit. Rather, it's that the Son participates in the procession and thereby makes it procession rather than a second son or generation. This seems to me to make the Spirit something like a grandson, but the important point I want to make here is that this cannot be reconciled to what fathers like Gregory the Theologian or John of Damascus or Maximus the Confessor says. This is flat out contradictory to it. And what it reveals is that East and West, if the filioque is interpreted in this way, are not saying the same thing. There is a real and important difference here. And also this real and important differences concerns issues which are which lie deeper, that is, the nature of deification, the nature of personhood, in what manner the persons of the Trinity are truly themselves, and so on and so forth. And I would suggest that Thomas's interpretation of the procession of the Spirit from the Father and the Son is related to his understanding of absolute divine simplicity, where all of God's properties are reducible to one another, and so there can only be one manner of relation in the Trinity, and the difference must be uh, uh, the number of persons involved in that single manner of relation. Uh, simplicity is a topic for another time. Uh, so that's that. Uh, that's why I think the filioque has to be rejected. Maximus regarded this particular issue, that is whether the Father is, alone is the cause of the Son and the Spirit, as a criterion of orthodoxy, and so I think one is warranted in regarding it uh, just as Maximus did in his own day. So. The question which lies before us is how do we understand the Son's relationship to the Spirit? Well, some Orthodox apologists would say it's because the Son um, and the Spirit are related not eternally but temporally. That is, the Son and the Spirit are like two hands of the Father, but in the economy of salvation, the Son pours out the Spirit, so he is called the Spirit of the Son in that temporal manner. 
a couple of reasons why this does not work. First of all, it's very clear from the fathers of East and West that they were speaking of an eternal relationship between the Spirit and the Son, which was unique to them. Uh, you can find plenty of these quotations online on Roman Catholic apologetic sites, but it's really abundantly clear. You cannot make the Spirit's uh, relationship to the Son a merely temporal relation. Second of all, it undermines the principle that the incarnation of the Son and the outpouring of the Spirit are revelatory of God's inner life. How is it that we know anything about God's inner life? It's because the Son and the Spirit, in time, have revealed that. Uh, and if we say that the outpouring of the Spirit by the Son is utterly unrelated to God's eternal life, then how do we know anything about God's eternal life at all? How do we know something about it which enables us to say it is unrelated? This is a very serious problem with any interpretation which reduces the relationship of the Son and the Spirit to a merely temporal one. Third of all, this is not actually the Orthodox teaching. Even St. Photius does speak in places of the Spirit's shining through the Son, apparently from eternity. So the question before us is then, how do we understand the Spirit's procession from the Father, from or through the Son? I want to note here that simply saying that Catholics understand the procession as being through the Son, uh, and that phrase being equivalent to from the Son, doesn't solve the issue because the question before us is, of course, how do we understand this phrase, through the Son? Do we understand it in the sense that the Son participates in the Father's hypostatic power? If we do, then it's no more orthodox than saying from the Son. And here's how orthodoxy understands the phrase through the Son. It understands it as an energetic procession. Now, I think I'll talk more about energies in another video, but a brief explanation for now. According to Orthodox theology, there is an eternal distinction between essence and energies in God. Essence is that which constitutes God as God, it's what makes him what he is, uh, and energies are God's activities. Now, activity here has a broader meaning than that which we usually consider it in common language. An activity can include something like a thought. This is an activity of a person. Activity is something like speech. This is really essential to biblical theology. Uh, activity are also those things we normally consider activities, like love. The Father eternally loves the Son. His loving of the Son is not identical to his essence, but rather it is a realization or manifestation of his essence. And so in this way, the energies are not disconnected from the essence, but reveal the essence without circumscribing it. For example, if I, in giving this talk right now, I'm revealing something about my inner life, about myself, about what makes me me, and I'm revealing something about human nature in speaking in this fashion. I do things only humans can do. For example, I reason, I speak, and so on. So my activities reveal what I am, but they don't circumscribe it. You won't learn everything about human nature, no matter how many words I speak, no matter how many actions I do. In fact, human nature is an infinite well from which infinite energies can come, which is why Gregory of Nyssa says human nature, like divine nature, is actually apophatic. Uh, and so in this sense, God's energies reveal what he is by essence, but they don't circumscribe it. In other words, the energies themselves are infinite because they infinitely reveal uh, God. So it, it's helpful to consider energies often as something like thoughts. Uh, for example, why do numbers exist? Well, numbers exist because they are the eternal thought of God. And there are an infinite amount of numbers. Why are there an infinite amount of numbers? Because God's thought is infinite. Uh, we speak, Maximus speaks of love as an energy of God. Uh, the Father eternally loves the Son by the Spirit. Uh, the Son eternally loves the Father by the Spirit. And because energies manifest or actualize the potentials which are intrinsic to an essence, uh, they are revelatory of that essence. We come to know God truly by participation in his energies. And that is actually why we can predicate properties of God at all. The properties of propria are identical to what we call energies or activities. Uh, and the reason that we can give names to these properties, like God is loving, God is just, and so on and so forth, is because we truly know them by participation. And so in this way, we disagree with Aquinas, who held that the only sort of predicate we make of God is analogical, and we agree with Scotus and say that there are such things as univocal predicates of God, that is, 
what we mean when we say God is love is exactly what we mean when we say a man loves truly, except that God has love to an infinitely greater degree. But it's the same thing qualitatively speaking. And I'm tempted to kind of make an argument here about analogical versus univocal predication, but I'll save that for another video. Um, but the important thing is that the energies are revelatory of the essence and that they are predicated uh, that they belong to the essence. That is, two persons who have an identical nature, if they manifest themselves as fully as can be manifest, will have, ex will have exactly identical energies. And this is important for what Maximus says when he says the eternal manifestation of the spirit through the sun manifests the unity and identity of the essence. Well, consider this is what Jesus says in John 5, that he works as the Father is working. There's a lot in John, by the way, about activities. Read through it one day and pay attention to when Jesus speaks of works or acts. John is in many ways a very advanced theology, both of the Trinity and of the divine energies. It's, it's very cool. Um, but here's how we understand the eternal manifestation of the spirit through the sun. Uh, there is a certain, all three divine persons manifest the same divine energies because they have the same nature and energies manifest nature. But they each manifest these energies in a way that is proper to themselves. So they manifest it in different ways. This is, in fact, how we know that God is Father, Son, and Spirit, even though we only know God through his energies, uh, because the energies are parsed out through the three divine persons in unique fashions. So the Father eternally loves the Son. The Father is the initiatory partner in this relationship of love. He moves towards the Son. Now, in the same moment, quote unquote, that the Father moves towards the Son, the Son receives that love and he reciprocates it to the Father. This is the foundation in the scriptures of all covenantal relationships. All covenantal relationships are described both as marital relationships, God is Israel's bridegroom, and as paternal relationships, God is Israel's father. The reason for this is found in this eternal relationship of movement towards reception and reciprocation. Uh, in Proverbs, uh, Christ is described as feminine divine wisdom as a bride because he is the receptive and reciprocal partner in this father-son relationship. And this is the same position that um, brides have in the marital relationship. Uh, C.S. Lewis says something very insightful that gender, that is masculinity or femininity, uh, is not identical to maleness and femaleness. Rather, maleness and femaleness is one particular instantiation of gender, which is this relation, uh, this dyad of movement towards reception and reciprocation. So that is the structure of the relationship between the Father and the Son. Well, what of the person of the Holy Spirit? We say the Holy Spirit manifests the, uh, the energies of the Father and the Son. And here's how it happens. The Father gener... Well, let's consider the, that we call the Spirit the Spirit of the Father, right? But in calling him the Spirit of the Father, that implies the reality of the Son, because the fa a Father is only Father in relation to a Son, and it also tells us that the Son is somehow prior to the Spirit, even though not temporally, because when we speak of the Spirit, we speak of him in a way that implies the existence of the Son, but it doesn't work the other way around. You couldn't deduce just from the name Son that there was such a person as the Holy Spirit. So what is this kind of priority? Why is it that the Spirit implies the existence of the Son? It is because the Spirit exists so that he might manifest the unity between the Father and the Son. It is not that the Spirit participates in the Father's spirit of power, and in so doing, pro produces the person of the Holy Spirit. It is rather that the purpose for the Spirit's existence is to manifest the unity between the Father and the Son. So, the Son is generated from the Father, and the Father, in loving the Son, produces the person of the Holy Spirit and sends his love by means of the Holy Spirit. And when the Son receives that love, he receives it 
by means of the Holy Spirit, which is why St. Seraphim of Sarah says that the Spirit proceeds from the Father and rests in the Son. The Son receives the Holy Spirit, and then the Son reciprocates this movement of love. And so he receives love from the Father through the Spirit and then returns his own love through the Holy Spirit back to the Father. We can see this man manifested temporally in the Gospels. When Jesus is baptized, he, the Spirit comes down from the Father, and the Father says, you are my beloved Son. The Father sends his love to the Son by means of the Spirit. And immediately after this, we are told that the Spirit drove Jesus out to the wilderness. And what does Jesus in the wilderness do? He manifests his love for God by obedience in the face of temptation. And so by the very Spirit whom he received from the Father, who drove him into the wilderness, Jesus exercised his love for his Father and thus returns the Spirit to the Father in that relationship of love. So in this manner of speaking, we say that the Spirit manifests the Father and the Son. He manifests their unique manner of relationship. And because they have the exact same energies, and indeed the Spirit has the exact same energies, he manifests the true unity of the Godhead. Now here's why this is really important. Paul in Galatians speaks of the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of the Son, or the Spirit of Adoption, the Spirit of Sonship. This is important because the Eternal Son became incarnate in order to constitute us as sons, and we are made sons through the Holy Spirit. But if the Spirit's identity, identity as the Spirit, if his procession from the Son was only in the sense that the Son participates in the Father's hypostatic property, then the sort of sonship which we receive would be utterly unrelated to the sonship which Christ has, because the Spirit's manifestation of the Son would only be through his relationship to our particular hypostatic property of Father and Son, which we do not, in fact, participate in. But if the eternal manifestation is the way to interpret the procession of the Spirit uh, from the Father and the Son, then it is exactly what we participate in because we are deified through participation of the divine in the divine energies. We cooperate, co-energize with God through the Holy Spirit who energizes in us. So, the Holy Spirit manifests the eternal relationship of Father and Son, and in so manifesting it to us, incorporates us into that relationship and thereby constitutes us as sons. And this pattern is found all over creation. It's found in the Eucharistic liturgy. We pray for the Holy Spirit to come down and make the bread and wine the body and blood of Christ. The Spirit manifests the, Father, or manifests the Son and reveals him in the Eucharistic elements. Another way to think about this in terms of the creative activity of God, we think of the Son as the Logos, because the Son sums up all the energies or activities or thoughts of God. Thus, he contains all of the inner principles for all of the different created things that exist. Why is a created thing this and not that? Why does it have this nature and not that nature? Because it participates in this particular way in the eternal divine thought of God in the way that something else doesn't participate, which is why they are two distinct things. But how is it that the same nature can be realized or manifested in multiple ways? This is through the Holy Spirit who manifests the eternal Logos, but he does so in a unique way. So if the Logos, if the Son, is like the lyrics to a song, if it's the text, the Spirit sings out these words in all sorts of different ways. You can sing the same words in many different tunes. So the Spirit is also in scripture associated with music. Paul says, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the spirit, singing songs and hymns and spiritual songs. And there are many other places in the scriptures where the spirit is associated with music. So the spirit eternally manifests the son, but he does not er derive his existence from the son. Uh, in 13th century, uh, 14th century Byzantium, uh, this was a very important distinction that we say the spirit exists through the Son, but he does not receive his existence through the Son. Um, 
you can think about it in this way. My manner of existence is through speech. I've all went, as long as I've known how to speak since early childhood, of course, I've been speaking, I exist through speech, I manifest myself through speech, I've been changed through speech, uh, everything I know is done by speech, including my very thought. But it's conceivable that I could live and not speak. Um, there have been isolated cases where a person can't speak at all. Uh, and so I do not derive my very existence from speech. However, my existence has always been in and through speech. So in the same way, the spirit eternally exists through the sun. This is how he's always been. He's always manifested the uh, uh, unity of father and son, but he does not thereby receive his existence from the son. He receives his existence from the father alone. Now, I want to make a final note before I go, which is that it's possible that in uh, medieval Catholicism, there was an alternative interpretation of the filioque, which was concordant with Orthodox faith. Uh, Christian Caps, who is a terrific scholar of medieval Byzantium, he's a Catholic, he's a terrific scholar of the schism, uh, he's an admirer of St. Mark of Ephesus, written really amazing stuff. He did his dissertation on St. Gennadius Scodarios, who was the first patriarch of Constantinople after the Turks came. He was a disciple of St. Mark of Ephesus, and he translated all the works of Aquinas. He was a terrific metaphysician. But anyway, Caps is a great scholar. Um, Caps suggests that the scotistic interpretation of the filioque was different from the Thomistic interpretation and is in fact identical to the doctrine of the energetic procession. I'm very, very open to this because St. Mark of Ephesus himself had studied Scotus and held Scotus to be in the manner, in the uh, issue of the divine energies and divine simplicity, he held Scotus to be concordant with St. Gregory Palamas and the Palamite teaching. The Council of Florence was dominated by Dominican theologians who followed St. Thomas in his theology, which is one of the reasons that the Council failed. So it's possible that um, there was a different interpretation of the filioque way, which was the same as an energetic procession. And it's notable that a number of Franciscan theologians expressly disagreed with Thomas's argument, which distinguished generation and procession in terms of the number of persons involved. I would be delighted to learn that this is true. I'm very open to it. I have not studied the issue enough to really say whether it's true or not. But I will say this, that it is important to understand the spirit's unique and sole procession from the Father's cause as giving him his identity as a spirit as not a theologumenon, but as a doctrine of the church, as a dogma of the church. Uh, this is how it was considered by Maximus the Confessor. Uh, the East has always insisted on it. If you believe Maximus, then in fact this is a feature of the Latin patristic tradition as well. This is non-negotiable because it affects very, very central issues in terms of our doctrine of God or doctrine of man, doctrine of salvation and deification. But perhaps it is not an insurmountable issue in that there may be an orthodox interpretation of the filioque way, which prevailed even into the medieval West. And this would also shed light on the way in which Maximus interpreted the Latin Fathers if this had once been the dominant interpretation. So it may be the case that the price of union between East and West is Thomism on these points. Um, it may be the case that the price of union between East and West, setting aside the issue of the papacy for now, is for the Western church to acknowledge as dogma what had once only been a theologumenon. I hope this is the case. It would make the issue a lot easier. Haven't studied enough to really say it or not. But I hope what in this video, what you've gotten is that the filioque way is really a central and important issue. Uh, historically speaking, it was the central and important issue the papacy has increased in importance since Vatican I, but I still think it's much less important than the filioque. Uh, and it's related to the question of the doctrine of divine energies, which I think is going to be my next video. Thank you so much for listening.